the Lord is risen indeed. Uh, Let's uh, join together in reading uh, Psalm 22 from verse 21 as an act of praise this morning. Psalm 22 from verse 21. The beginning of Psalm 22, as you know, uh, is a prophetic word, a prophetic psalm concerning the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And in verse 21, Uh, He prays, save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild wild oxen. You have answered me. And that's the great turning point in the psalm. And from verse 22 on then uh, is uh, the the risen uh, Messiah uh, praising God amongst his people. So shall we stand and read together Psalm 22 and from verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, Nor has he hidden his face from him, but when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, For all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A prosperity shall serve him. It will be recounted to the Lord To the next generation, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. Amen. Let's uh, come to God in prayer. Let us all pray. We praise and we magnify your great and your glorious name, our Heavenly Father that we have been brought into your kingdom, into your family, sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you that we've been purchased by precious blood of a glorious living Redeemer who laid down his life for us at Calvary and on the third day was raised again in the power of an endless life. We thank you that he sits on the throne of the universe, that all things are under his feet. And knowing such truth as this, all things subservient to him who has loved us with an everlasting love, we live our lives with joy, with confidence, and with deep assurance. We ask that as we gather for worship today, you would be with us in your mighty presence and by your Spirit, filling uh, the praises of our hearts and the, the Word of God with power and grace to us to transform us today. Grant us these mercies, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We'll take as our reading uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 25, Isaiah chapter 25, and Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Let's hear the word of God. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you, I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For you have made a city a ruin, a fortified city a ruin, a palace for foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore the strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible nations will fear you, for you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. You will reduce the noise of aliens. 
As heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud, the song of the terrible ones will be diminished. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wine on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the leaves. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For on this mountain the hand of the Lord will rest, and Moab shall be trampled down under him, as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. And he will spread out his hands in their midst, as a swimmer reaches out to swim, and he will bring down their pride, together with the trickery of their hands. The fortress of the high fort of your walls he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, down to the dust. And from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, reading from verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they didn't believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed marvelling to himself at what had happened. And then from uh, the epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, and from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the Twelve, after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I laboured more abundantly than they all, yet not I but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore whether it was I or they, 
so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then also those who have perished, uh, sorry, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says, all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Amen. God bless the reading of his word uh, to us this morning. Let's come now to God in prayer. Let us all pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for resurrection hope, resurrection life today. We thank you for this Easter Sunday when we remember this great and central fact of our faith, that you have by your mighty power raised up your son Jesus from the dead. We thank you that he was raised because of his obedience in laying down his life. This command that he received from you. Uh, he has come into the world. He has lived amongst us, living that life that we could never live ourselves. Of perfect obedience to your holy law. And he has laid down that perfect and holy life in sacrifice for us bearing our shame, our guilt, our penalty, taking our sins far away, removing that wrath uh, that they attracted and deserved, and bearing it all himself. And we thank you for that perfect obedience in a life lived and a life laid down. You have raised him up, raising him the third day according to all that was promised by the prophets, and exalting him to your right hand. We thank you that he has been raised up from that ignominious death, from the shame of the tomb, raised up in the power of an endless life, exalted to your right hand, having ascended through the heavens and passing the massed ranks of the holy angels and ascending the throne of God. We thank you that he sits there now, enthroned with a majestic sweetness and we worship him our living lord jesus christ thanking you for him for his perfection for his majesty for the glory that belongs to him as the son of god enthroned in heaven and we bless you for his love and for his grace that he should do all this for us we who are sinners and unworthy of the least of your benefits, you have bestowed upon us treasures and granted us an inheritance that we cannot presently comprehend. And we stand amazed, Lord, in the presence of so great a God, so great a Saviour, for such wonderful love. And we bless you that we can be here today to worship and to praise you and to think of that great and eternal day when we will be caught up into your presence 
forever. Oh, may our hearts be full of love for this Saviour, full of praise to you, our great God, for so great a redemption that you have worked in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege of being the people of God, for having your indwelling spirit, for knowing its resurrection power in new life, for knowing its resurrection power, invigorating us today for service, for worship. And we, uh, we pray, Lord, that we might live in the light of that every day, giving ourselves to you, to the service of so great a King and Lord, and rejoicing in our hope and resting here. We thank you that this is the end of all our labours for salvation, for acceptance, that we can rest as sons and daughters in the great love of God and in your precious promises and in the certainty of their fulfilment in that day. So help us today, we pray, uh, to live and walk as sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you that all these wonderful things assuage the pains and the traumas of the hurt and the, 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 the pains that are known in this life. Lord, you have put us into a world of woe and the things that we endure are our fault. They're due to our own follies and uh, we have been caught up then into a fallen world and we know pains and we know the pains then of the children of God that our Saviour spoke of that we would suffer for his name's sake. But we thank you that all these things they are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And so we thank you that you take the, the, the painful edge off the experiences of this life that would drive us back and beat us down. And we find ourselves on our feet today worshipping you and praising you for such goodness and for such grace. We pray for brothers and sisters today who are in the midst of difficulties and troubles. And especially we think of the church in many parts of the world today who because it is resurrection day will suffer because they worship this risen lord jesus christ will be attacked and persecuted be with them strengthen and keep them we pray help them today be a shield to them today we pray and as they worship may their hearts be filled with hope and confidence and joy as they look to that eternal day that day of resurrection uh, for them we ask for our brothers and sisters in the congregation here who are in the midst of difficulties and our families and our children and our children's children. Lord, we commit and commend them to your tender watch care that you'd be with them and watch over them and bless them. And especially we pray for your saving grace to be the portion of those we know and love that by your mighty power, that same power that raised up Jesus from the dead, you would bring them from death to life from their ignorance to the knowledge of God. Lord, have mercy upon them, we pray. Thank you for the countless blessings that we enjoy. Thank you for your mercies. We rejoice with, with Jack and Gloria in your faithfulness to them uh, through these 60 years. And we thank you for the, the joy that they are to the congregation here. Bless them, we pray, and their family. Have mercy upon them and others in the church with their particular needs. Uh, for our brother Derek as he recovers from surgery and for Will uh, and for our sister Lorna uh, for those who are grieving, who are bereaved Lord have mercy upon them we pray strengthen and keep them and we ask for our land, for our leaders again in this time of uh, continuing crisis in our nation give them much wisdom we pray and understanding and help them in all their decisions as they seek to do the very best for us Give them grace, we pray, and, uh, and guide and direct their steps. And may we soon be delivered from all the restrictions that are presently imposed upon us as a nation. And remember the nations of the world, we pray, in their distresses. Have mercy, Lord. May we soon be delivered as we ask these things for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, will you turn with me to the uh, epistle to the Philippians? And chapter 3. I'm going to take as a text this morning uh, Philippians 3 and verse 10, but I'll read from verse 1. 
Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yes, indeed, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead." I take as a text, as I say, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. There are many ways in which we may think about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Most commonly, we think of the resurrection of a, as a historical and objective fact. God raised Jesus from the dead. But I want us to think of the resurrection this morning as a subjective and an experimental fact. Uh, to uh, first assure, uh, or we could say the first, subjective and experimental, the first assures us that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and the Saviour. And the second brings us an assurance about ourselves that if we know the power of the uh, resurrection of Jesus, then we need never be afraid or defeated. The Christian life is a resurrection life. The Bible tells us that not only is Jesus raised from the dead uh, to a, a new life, but we have been raised in him to newness of life. And this is what gives the Christian life its most distinctive characteristic. We are raised to life in Jesus Christ. Who are God's people? Romans chapter 6 and verse 13 tells us that they are those who are alive from the dead. 1 John 3 verse 4 says that it is those who can say uh, of God that uh, he has brought them out of death into life. That's how the New Testament then views a Christian. And they are people who in union with Jesus Christ have already experienced the resurrection. We are risen with him, the scripture says. So it's not only Jesus who is risen from the dead, but we have been risen too. At its beginning, in its continuing, and in its completion, which is yet to come, God's people in the Christian life are entering ever more fully into the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus. That's what the New Testament teaches us. Would that that were true of every one of us here this morning, that we knew and are knowing day by day as we live our lives in this world the power of Jesus' resurrection in our own experience. So that's our theme this morning, taking as that text, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So Paul didn't only want the suffering, uh, sorry, to share in the suffering and dying of Jesus, he also wanted to share in the resurrection of Jesus and to know the power of Jesus' resurrection in his life. So I want us to look then at the beginning of the Christian life, the continuing of the Christian life, and the completion of the Christian life, and to see how at each unfolding stage in Christian experience, uh, we are living in the power of the resurrection. First then, is that we are to know the power of Christ's resurrection at the beginning 
of the Christian life. Now to get an overall grasp of that theme, we have to refer to a number of uh, passages this morning. So Ephesians, the first is Ephesians and chapter 1 and verse 17. Ephesians 1 verse 17. He prays that the God of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being un enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now, do you notice there in verse 19 how Paul stacks up words to indicate the greatness of God's power? He uses words from which we derive our English words, power, energy, strength, might. And he describes these things as being exceedingly great. God's power and energy, his strength, his might are incomparably great, he says. The power of God is infinite. And Paul prays that the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation will enlighten the eyes of our understanding. That we might know the incomparable greatness of God's power. Well, if you're a Christian, don't you want to know that? Don't you want to understand and grasp that? Paul tells us two things about the incomparable greatness of God's power. First, he says it is supremely displayed in Christ. The second thing he says is that it is available to us. It's available to you and to me if we are God's people. That's what he says. The greatness of God's power is supremely displayed in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. A university professor in the last day or two has uh, caused a bit of a Twitter storm by saying, don't you realize dead people don't rise? Well, can you hear the sound of Christianity collapsing the world over? The power of God has been displayed only in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, when God not only arrested the natural processes of decay and decomposition, but reversed it and more than reversed it, transcended it by raising Jesus up from the dead to, to a new life. God displays his power, he says, in the resurrection of Jesus. And then he says that that same power is made available to us if we put our trust in this risen Saviour. The power of God is offered to you and to me today. It's the same power that was displayed when he raised Jesus up from the tomb. Resurrection power. But what is Paul referring to at that point? Well, he's talking about conversion. He's talking about the beginning of the Christian life. Because he writes here about their new birth and conversion in terms of resurrection. In he Ephesians 1, just after saying this, he says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. He describes their state before conversion as a state of death. They were dead on account of their sins and trespasses in which they were living their lives. In other words, they were cut off from God, he says. And in addition to that, at the end of chapter 2, he says they were cut off from the people of God. Because they were Gentiles, they had no part amongst the covenant people of God at that time, who were the Jews. So there was this double alienation, alienated from God and alienated from the people of God. That's their condition and he calls it spiritual death. That's the condition in which everyone who is not a Christian finds themselves today. The Bible describes the non-Christian as spiritually dead. But God raises a believer up out of that spiritual death and double alienation into a double reconciliation. He brings us into fellowship with himself and he brings us into fellowship with his people, which is why Christians can travel the world over 
and meet others who are complete strangers to them and yet immediately know these are kin because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. New life that God gives us in fellowship with himself and with one another. So it, the death in which we live as unbelievers, that death is alienation from God and alienation from God's people. And the spiritual life he gives us in the new birth is a double reconciliation to God and to the people of God. To be raised in Christ is to be reconciled to him and to one another. I wonder if you've grasped that fully. You see, it seems to me there's been a very dangerous tendency that has arisen even amongst evangelical Christians in the past two or three decades. We see it almost everywhere today in the church. There's a tendency to trivialize the gravity of the spiritual state of a person before the new birth. We trivialize it. And there's a tendency then to trivialize the glory of our spiritual life in Christ after we are born anew. Many Christians think of their unregenerate friends and their unregenerate family members as nice people, maybe very nice people, really. And all they need is just a little bit of spirituality and they'll be okay. If only they would take on board a little bit of religion and a little bit of Christianity, that'll just make it all just fine. That isn't the reality of the situation at all, though, is it? According to the New Testament, outside of Christ, they're spiritually dead, in trespasses and sins, and are utterly unable to raise themselves from the dead. Dead people cannot raise themselves from the dead. They need someone else to do it. And only God can do that. Only God can raise people from spiritual death to new life and everlasting life. And not only do people trivialize, trivialize that, uh, that state and seriousness of uh, death before conversion, but they also underestimate and they very much trivialize the experience of regeneration, new birth, New life in Christ. There's a tendency to reduce the experience of the new birth to something that is akin only to human resolve. As if it's no more than someone just deciding and determining that in future they're going to be better. They'll reform themselves and they'll add a bit of religion to their lives and they'll be okay. And so we talk as of, of the new birth as if it's no more than someone choosing, someone deciding to follow Jesus and to add a thin veneer of religion to their lives, as if that's all it took, as if that was sufficient. But that isn't enough, you see. That isn't enough. The non-Christian, the unbeliever, is spiritually dead. And new life in Christ begins with nothing less than a resurrection from that death. Pardon me, it's a spiritual resurrection, a resurrection from spiritual death to new spiritual life by the power of God alone. So the Christian life is a radically new life. It isn't a veneer of religiosity so that you're just the same old pagan underneath, really. Not at all. The beginning of the Christian life is a resurrection. It is nothing less than that. It is as radical as that. And the problem we see with trivialising these great New Testament truths and the danger attached to it is that once those things are trivialised, everything else becomes distorted. If you trivialise the beginning of the Christian life, well, your attitude to evangelism will be distorted. We begin to imagine it's something that we can do. That we can evangelise people and we can bring them to Christ. But when you remember that the beginning of the Christian life is a resurrection from the dead, you realize that you cannot do it. Only God raises the dead. And if you trivialize the beginning of the Christian life, then your attitude to God is distorted. And you can begin to imagine that you can give to, uh, we can give to ourselves credit for becoming Christians. After all, I made the choice. 
What a good man I must be. I've chosen to follow Jesus. When all the time, our proper place is on our face in the dust, astonished that God should have anything to do with us at all as sinners and have mercy on us, that he should reach out to us from heaven by his mighty arm and power and raise us from the dead should always be amazing to us. Amazing grace. And if we trivialize the beginning of the Christian life, then our attitude to ongoing, deeper experience, spiritual experience in our future life is going to be distorted as well. You might sometimes hear Christians speak in exaggerating terms and they elevate their experiences and they say, well, my early Christian life, you see, is, well, it's nothing compared to, to what I have now. Really? Really? Your conversion, the beginning of your Christian life, was a resurrection from the dead. What could possibly be greater than that? You see, if you trivialize the beginning of the Christian life and think of it as almost a small thing to become a Christian and forget that it was a resurrection from the dead, your view of everything else will be distorted as a result of that. The very beginning of the Christian life requires the resurrection power of God to raise you from the death of sin and alienation into new life in Christ Jesus. Maybe this morning you are sitting here and you are not yet a Christian. And maybe you have told yourself, one day, one day might, I might become a Christian. One day I might decide. That isn't how it is at all, you see. The fact is you are helpless, you are hopeless, unless God in mercy comes to you. And you are entirely in his hands. It's not that Jesus is in your hand and you decide whether you'll follow him. You are in his hand and he will decide your eternal destiny. And if he does not have mercy on you, you haven't got a shred of hope. You should be on your face crying out for mercy to him. Because only his power can raise you from the dead. The second thing is to know the power of Christ's resurrection, not only in that vital beginning, but also in the continuing of the Christian life. If you've got a Bible, just turn back to Paul's great letter to the Romans, to Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, Paul writes not only about the beginning of the Christian life, but its continuing. He says, but, sorry, uh, but we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Paul's writing there about Christian experience after, following, following conversion. He's talking about what he calls the flesh and the spirit. The flesh is our fallen human nature, our nature before conversion. And the spirit is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us when we belong to Christ. Now, if you belong to Christ says Paul, we no longer live in the flesh, but we live in the spirit. In other words, what dominates and controls the life of a Christian is not the flesh, the, that fallen nature, but it is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. We're told in Galatians 5, it's the Holy Spirit within us who alone can subdue and control our fallen human nature. Now why is that? Well, it's because of who the Holy Spirit is. Here in verse 9, he's called the Spirit of God. He's also in verse 9 called the Spirit of Christ. But notice what he's called in verse 11. He is the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead. 
He's the Spirit who has the power of resurrection life. Now, if that Spirit dwells in you, he says, then the flesh, the old fallen nature, can be subdued and controlled. Our fallen nature is very strong, isn't it? You know that, and I know that. Only resurrection power can subdue it and control it. It's only when the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in us that the flesh can be brought under control. Now there's a great deal of nonsense spoken about the Holy Spirit in Christian circles. Today all manner of people are peddling all manner of unbiblical ideas through religious TV broadcasts and radio and magazines and so on. We don't hear nearly enough about this vital aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit today. We don't hear enough about our need of the Holy Spirit and, and the possibility of this resurrection power being so at work in us to subdue and to control fallen human nature. It seems to me that we live at far too low a level of personal holiness. And in our poor moral performance, we acquiesce too readily to the power of the flesh. Our temptations persist, and we persistently give in to them. Sin continues to beset us, and sometimes to overwhelm us. And we too readily give in to the idea that there's no remedy. No remedy for my bad temper. No remedy for my irritability. And my jealousy and my malice and my selfishness and my sexual immorality and my pride and my greed, that these things are far too strong for me. I can't control these things, we say, and there's no hope of ever overcoming them. And I'm just destined to fall and fall again. And so we excuse ourselves and we say, temptation, it's just, it's just too big, it's just too big for me, I can't overcome it. But over against all that pessimism, you see, the New Testament sets up the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. God raised Jesus from the dead, set him at his right hand, and God has put all things under his feet so that he rules over all. So where are these evil powers that keep gaining control over us? Where are they? Well, they are under the feet of Jesus too. They are subject to him too. And so if I enter into the resurrection power of Jesus, I begin to be transformed into his image. And the old things of my life are increasingly subdued. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we may put to death the demands and the deeds and the evil impulses of the fallen nature. So in the beginning of the Christian life and in the day-to-day -day continuing of the Christian life, we need to know the resurrection power of Jesus. And then finally, the completing of the Christian life. And of course, that'll be when he raises our mortal bodies, when we will have new bodies in the day of the Lord. Did you know that already, already uh, before the resurrection of our bodies, we can experience what we can call the invigoration of our bodies. So that before the resurrection of our bodies on the last day, we can know a kind of mini-resurrection. Just uh, look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4 for a moment. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 14, Paul write, writes about the resurrection of, of the body knowing that he who raised, us, raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus. That's the final resurrection of the body he's talking about there, which is to take place on the last day, the great day of the Lord, the day of judgment. But look back to verse 10. He, said, he speaks of always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal body. Now that is an experience of resurrection life, the resurrection power of Jesus 
in our mortal bodies now, today, before the resurrection of the body. We know that because Paul has been referring in verses 8 and 9 to the physical persecution he endured as an apostle, as a preacher. He was, he says, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, uh, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Paul was often afflicted, stoned, whipped, beaten. He says in verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So, hard pressed on every side yet, not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. And more than that, it isn't only that Paul survived all those ordeals in his body, it's not that he just managed to recover from it all and pop up again, but more than that, in the midst of those poor, uh, those persecutions, his poor, frail, tired, bruised and battered body felt within itself the invigorating power of the resurrection of Jesus, he says. To Paul, inwardly in his body, the risen Lord Jesus gave inner reserves of strength. And we can know that still today, he saying. It's not that you can claim physical healing from all your aches and pains and diseases. We await the day of resurrection when we will be finally free of all those things forever. God does sometimes heal today. He heals by medical means, by surgical treatments, and sometimes he heals supernaturally. But Paul's point here is that if he, even if he doesn't heal us, even before the day of resurrection dawns upon us, even now in our physical infirmities, the resurrection life of Jesus can be manifested in our mortal bodies. His resurrection power can be manifest in our physical weakness. His resurrection life can be experienced in our physical mortality. And to know the resurrection power of Jesus is sometimes to, he uh, to experience physical healing, but it's always to experience vigor, vitality. Well, let me just draw these things quickly to a close. The Christian life is resurrection life. It is knowing the power of Christ's resurrection. It is knowing the power of Christ's resurrection at each stage of the Christian life. At the very beginning, which is a regeneration, a resurrection from death, the death of a double alienation, alienation from God, and alienation from the people of God into the life of the knowledge of God and fellowship with his people. Resurrection power in the continuing of the Christian life. As we go on growing in holiness, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, the fallen nature, by the resurrection power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it's resurrection power at the completion of the Christian life also. Through the resurrection of the body. This, we have a foretaste of that today, nonetheless, in our mortal flesh, says Paul. And each of those stages is a kind of resurrection. Life out of death. Resurrection spiritually at the moment of our conversion. Resurrection morally in our in our growth in holiness, resurrection physically in our bodies. We can know the power of the resurrection now in our mortal flesh, but then finally in the completion of the work. See, the whole of the New Testament emphasizes this power of God. Do you believe in the power of God? Or is it just some intellectual concept for you? Do we believe in it? You see, the gospel is not an exhortation to you to do anything. The gospel isn't good news that tells a man or a woman that I can save myself. That isn't good news to me, because I know that I can't do it. Everything in my experience tells me that I can't do it. I can't save myself. The gospel doesn't call me to exert my power. 
But the gospel tells me God has exercised his power. Which is why Paul tells us we need the eyes of our understanding to be opened, to be enlightened, to see the power of God that has been at work in the world. And he tells us that not only does God give it illumination, internal sight to see the power of God, but God has also given us an outward, physical, visible, public de- declaration and demonstration of his power in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You see, God has given us two great examples of his power in the history of the world. The first is in the act of creation, the creation of the universe. The second is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah the prophet says, Lord God, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too hard for you. Paul prays that you may know the exceeding greatness of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And it's Abraham who brings those two ideas together. Because we are told that uh, the God of a, uh, the God who Abraham trusted, it's uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, the God who Abraham trusted was the God who gives life to the dead, who brings into existence things that don't exist. See? Resurrection and creation. So I want you to go out from here this morning expecting more from the power of God. Expect more from the power of God. Nothing is too hard for him. He who raised up Jesus from the dead can raise us up too. He can give us life. Raise us up from the death of alienation so that we are reconciled to God and reconciled to his people. Raise us up from the death of weakness in the face of temptation. And death, resurrection from the death of self-centeredness. He can raise us up by his mighty power. We are not yet morally perfect. Not yet are our bodies fully redeemed. But alongside the not yet, we must also put the already. Already, the resurrection power of God is at loose and at work in the world, and it's available to you this morning and to me. And we need our eyes open to see it and to know it. Uh, The Lord bless his word to us. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we bow before you, your awesome majesty, your great power, your astonishing love and grace, that great work of redemption that you've wrought in your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that you raised him from death uh, to the power of an endless life, and uh, that that same power has been at work in every child of God, that our conversion, our regeneration, was nothing less than your almighty power bringing us out of death into life, out of the thraldom of Satan's kingdom into the light and liberty of the people of God. We thank you that that same power has been at work in your children, transforming them day by day from one degree of glory to another. We pray that we might grow in holiness and righteousness day by day, incrementally being conformed to the image of your Son, transformed more and more into his likeness by that same resurrection power. And we look to that day when we will say goodbye forever to sin and sorrow, to suffering and sadness, and begin our holiest, happiest days when by your resurrection power you raise us up and we are forever with the Lord. Grant that these wonderful and astonishing truths may thrill and fill our hearts today and direct our steps in the days ahead as we ask it for Jesus sake. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.